Hello, everybody, and fellow Reds. Welcome to the room, the bro- uh, the podcast brought to you by LFC Transfer Room. Uh, I'm one of your co-hosts today, Richie, and I'm joined by our very own Chris Stonage, accredited journalist and LFC Transfer Room YouTuber. How are you today, Chris? I am absolutely fantastic, mate. Very, very happy. This is my first appearance on this podcast. Uh, I'm usually natter along by myself to a camera, so it's good to have some uh, some guests to chat to. Fantastic. I'm sure it won't be your last time as well, bud. <laughs> um, and we also have another special guest today, CBS Sports Soccer Podcaster, Luis Miguel Echegaray. It's a pleasure you to have so you on the room today. You were so close. I know. <laughs> I was practicing beforehand as well, and I've just butchered. And I was fine before, and I've just butchered it. So I am so I, sorry. No, you first of all don't ever apologize uh, for trying to say my name. It's not easy. It's not Jane Smith or anything like that. And I love it. Because <laughs> Everybody does it. Like before it tapes, everybody says it so beautifully. And then once you press record, everybody freaks out. It's fine. You said it, you said it beautifully. Beautifully. It's, it's the pressure, man. It's the pressure. How are you anyway? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, very excited to uh, chat some Liverpool uh, with you boys. Uh, very excited. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. Your, your podcast for CBS uh, covers the Euros and Copper America right now. So how have you been enjoying those two tournaments? Well, uh, professionally, I haven't been enjoying it at all because I'm not sleeping. It's absolutely <laughs> yeah. uh, just uh, there's just, you know, football on football on football. And it's kind of crazy. Uh, personally, I'm loving it. Right. Uh, obviously, the Euros, uh, I grew up in England, but I'm also Peruvian. So I have investment in both with uh, Peru and England. So it's been great. But yes, it's a lot of work, a lot of work. I can only imagine. Yeah, it's hard enough keeping up with the Euros over here, so uh, I can only imagine. Um, But moving forwards, we have, uh, as always, an informative and insightful transfer-related podcast for you all. And we'll also have some questions as well for both Chris and Lewis. Um, The three of us will be taking you through all things transfer-related to Liverpool Football Club, and obviously we'll be picking uh, each other's brains too. So to start us off, let's begin with the quick transfer update. And Chris, please do take us away. I will. And this is a video on the channel a couple of days ago and from the source of a Liverpool FC website. Adrian, the reserve goalkeeper, has signed a new contract extension, which will keep the Spaniard on Merseyside next season, with the contract rumoured to be two years. A second um, transfer rumour comes from Tuto Udinese. And that's Liverpool are actually still interested in Udinese midfielder Rodrigo de Paul, who is looking for the exit doors from the Serie A club. Atletico Madrid are favourites to land the Argentinian, but the report does say that both Liverpool and Arsenal are keeping an eye on the creative midfielder. Calcio Mercato say that Jurgen Klopp is planning to bolster his defence with Atalanta's Christian Romero, but for, with Juve's Christian Romero, who was on loan at Atalanta. But he will face competition from Manchester United and he's valued at around €50 million. Euros. And our final one is this man again, Pat Sandaka. He's soon going to have his very own segment on the Room podcast. He's apparently rejected a proposal from West Ham. Liverpool, Leicester, Chelsea and RB Leipzig have all declared interest in the Zambian international starlet. We know he's on the move because his international manager decided not to include him in the current squad, so Daka himself could sort out his future. But as of yet, his destination is unknown. And I have my fingers and toes crossed that he's heading to Merseyside. Yeah. And for more information on that, more Daka stories probably, uh, go visit our website, lfctransfer.com. Excellent. Um, Lewis, is there any, uh, are there any rumours there or any rumours around Liverpool Football Club that have taken your interest or you you know think actually that would be a very good move or maybe not a good move well i tell you what uh guys rodrigo de po is a player he is an absolute talent i've actually been watching for a while now and fabrizio romano my friend and colleague who joins k golas on cbs every week uh, we talk so much so highly of him and you know i would be very intrigued to see what decision he makes uh, you know i believe that atletico madrid as you mentioned leads the race to that you know, very uh, interested in the Argentinian. And I think being the fact that it's La Liga and he, you know, he doesn't have to worry so much about language issues and of course the culture itself and having Argentinian contingency with Cholo Simeone, you know, you would imagine that that's the way to go. But maybe, who knows, maybe Liverpool, Jurgen Klopp uh, can make a a little uh, bigger pitch and and maybe bring in it. But I tell you something, he's playing right now in Copa America, right in that triangular midfield for Argentina and he's an absolute talent. So I really would love to see what he does beyond Serie A. 
his numbers have been crazy this season. Um, I think Leeds were rumoured to sign him at the end of the transfer window last season and they ended up not signing him. Um, and I, I should think they rude to regret that decision now, but he does look an absolute talent. Yeah, he, he's amazing. And listen, when Marcelo Yelsa even hints at an interest in somebody, you know that uh, the rumor mill around Leeds United is going to surface. But, you know, to be honest with you, when it comes to South American talent that's coming specifically from the European continent, sometimes what happens is they want to stay within, you know, La Liga, Serie A, etc., even the Bundesliga, as opposed to making a move to the Premier League unless they get a bigger pitch. Uh, but because Liverpool obviously you know, a Champions League team, at the, you know, uh, won the Premier League, recently won the Champions League as well. Such a big squad. You guys are, are a very giant club. I would imagine that any kind of pitch, direct, official, uh, you know, offer might might intrigue him. But I, I think I think that uh, Atletico still leads with this. But you never know. But he, he's the kind of player that you guys need because Rodrigo de Paul is not just a workhorse in the midfield. He's a creator. And, and he makes things happen. He moves the chains. And, you know, when you have players like Mohamed Salah, Firmino, Mane right in front of you, you need that kind of person in the middle. You know, if you have Jordan Henderson, et cetera, you know, you need somebody else that is not afraid to hold the ball and kind of carry with it very much. And I know that we're going to talk about it in a second, but kind of similar to what Jack Grealish does with Villa. Yeah, absolutely. And I mentioned on the podcast, Liverpool, like, need somebody like that, somebody to drive the midfield forwards, because that's what Naby Keita was supposed to come in and do. And that's what the Ox did before his injury. And we have missed goals from midfield this season. We're also obviously linked with Florian Neuhaus, um, who I think could come in and do something similar. I don't think he's a, as developed, perhaps, as Rodrigo de Paul, but he is obviously only 24. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's one of those that some, whether or not we sign a genie replacement, I, I personally think we probably need to. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. Chris, what, what about your thoughts on any of those rumours? Yeah, well, you, you mentioned at the end Neuhaus. Um, I did. A, I actually had a chat with a Bundesliga expert about him uh, yesterday, and he's a massive fan. Uh, he's only young. Um, he's got a lot of the qualities that Wijnaldum possesses, but also that sort of goal-scoring touch that he has for the Netherlands as well. Um, he's really, really class. But, and, and Adrian, I mean, he's got a lot of stick. Um, for I mean, it's probably unfair, some of it. I mean, he has got a mistake in him, maybe even two or three mistakes in him. But as a third choice goalkeeper, I don't really get the uh, the anger from, from some fans about us keeping him on because he, he'll hardly ever play. Call him like the Ben Davis of goalkeepers almost. Um, and, and hopefully that stays like that. But um, I, I'm quite content with the players we're getting linked with. And if Liverpool, are, like, I'm not worried if we don't sign a player because usually if Liverpool do sign a player, it's quite successful. Absolutely. I think with the Adrian as well, uh, it seems like from the reports, I, I mean, I wrote um, for LFC Transfer Room um, the story where Adrian re-signed his contract and a lot of his quotes were actually like, Jurgen Klopp wants me around for the team and I'm a really good team player. So it looks like he's he's there as well for his personality, you know, more so than his <laughs> ability. And that's absolutely fine. You know, that's at the end of the day players do play that role. James Milner is now playing that role. Jordan Henderson will play that role in a couple of years as well. So you need players like that around the dressing room, which is why a lot of people were so devastated when Adam Lallana went. So, you know, we need yeah. players like that. Some guys, the, sometimes the nice guy does win and that's what we want to see. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, Lewis, on to you, really. You work, obviously, for CBS Sports, um, a huge American uh, television network. Um, football or, or soccer, uh, I didn't know how to word it, is obviously uh, growing over in the States. How has soccer changed over the past few years and how big do you see it getting? Yeah, I mean, listen, you can call it football or soccer. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, at the, or football, right? Or calcio, whatever you want. At the end of the day, uh, you know, we all basically speak the same language when we watch it and when we read it, and when we listen to it, et cetera, et cetera. The game here is growing, guys, a lot, uh, tremendously, partly because obviously, you know, the demographics in the U.S. is changing a lot. It's very young. It's very diverse and it's very interested in not just uh, the Premier League, but also the national teams. And I speak when I say national teams, I don't just talk about USA. I also talk about Mexico, but also the other component as well is that this is a sport that ex is extremely accessible in the U.S. Uh, you know, the way that you can watch matches here is unbelievable, right? As I'm talking to you right now, I'm watching the Euros on my phone. By ESPN, CBS Sports has a Champions League as well. We, we have Serie A coming next season as well. So, you know, um, League A can be accessible. We can watch the Nations League, both European and CONCACAF, Copa Americas on two networks. It's just the abundance 
of content is so easy to get. And I think that that's a major uh, driving point because obviously so many young people, you know, are not just watching it through linear TV. They're watching it on their phones, you know, their, their laptops, whatever it is. So that's another part. So it's just growing. And the other thing that people forget is that football in the U.S., soccer, I mean, is from a participation perspective, it's the most popular sport in the country. It, it's played everywhere, always. And we forget how big this country is and how, you know, from upper class white suburban neighborhoods to minority areas uh, from both Latino uh, and black and Afro-Caribbean uh, communities, it's just everywhere. So, you know, imagine this melting pot of, of young football fans just growing and growing, which is why it's no secret and it's no surprise that the World Cup's going to come here in 2026 because this game, whether people like it or not, will eventually be, you know, the most popular sport in the country. And I think that's yeah. when, uh, you know, with with American sports, you know, being as big as they are, I can see, you know, the United States of America producing a very good national team in the not too distant future. Absolutely. I mean, listen, the biggest problem with the US when it comes or for a long time was that obviously the system here when it comes to coaching, uh, children, kids, and youth academies and everything like that, it's very different from the European or even the South American model. That is changing now. You know, U.S. soccer, the federation itself, is realizing that you can enter so many different areas and many communities that once you took for granted, and now, like you said, you can find these gems. And the other thing as well, as what we're seeing right now, the, the men's, I mean, the women's team has always been you know, the absolute Goliath, uh, right? That their program is tremendous and they bring so much talent. The men's has always sort of, you know, lagged behind. But what we're seeing now, right? Christian Pulisic, a Champions League winner. Weston McKenney playing for Juventus. Gio Reyna, a star for Borussia Dortmund. You know, we could go on and on. These players now, they're not just like playing bit roles in their clubs. They're playing central roles in major European teams. And that's nothing but good news for the US. So, you know, it's just going to keep happening. I mean, I, I mentioned three players. I could go on and on. Serginio Des, Barcelona, et cetera. So, you know, the future is bright for the US MNT. They just, they just have to keep pushing that, uh, you know, that pitch of becoming the best in CONCACAF because, you know, as they saw against Mexico, they can compete for sure. Yeah, and it's not just America to talk about you. You are Peruvian originally. You came over to England and ended up supporting Aston Villa. Um, I read your story about uh, your relationship with them and why you chose to support them. But for those who haven't, uh, could you could you mind narrating it for us? Because it's, it's quite endearing. No, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it for reading it. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm Peruvian, but I left Peru when I was uh, 11, 12 years old. Uh, at a time when Peru was going through social and political turmoil, I moved to England uh, and, uh, you know, I, I moved to, you know, an area in London and where it was very Greek and very Turkish, but I'm Peruvian. So the Greeks asked me, the Greeks thought I was Turkish. The Turkish thought I was Greek. And I said, no, I'm Peruvian. And they were like, what the hell does that mean? They didn't know where Peru was from, you know, connecting it just to Paddington Bear, et cetera. Right. So I had a very difficult time trying to connect in the first years in England, obviously the language was an issue, culturally it was an issue, but I love football, right? Obviously coming from Peru, South America, I wanted to support a team. I, I wasn't really feeling the warmth from like a London-based team. I wasn't really feeling the connection. And uh, when I moved there, it was the very beginning of the Premier League. And uh, I made best friends with this kid, Mark Russell, um, who huge Villa fan. He took me to his house one day and I saw posters of Dalian Atkinson and all these heroes of Aston Villa. You know, Villa, Aston Villa kind of sounded a little Spanish. I love the color, love the claret and blue. I just love the history. It didn't hurt that we were doing well as well when the second, of course, in the debut season of the Premier League. So all those things just, you know, came together. They took me to Villa Park and that's when I just fell in love uh, with, with Villa and it, it just became they kind of became my my savior in a way because it was the first uh, opportunity for me to connect to England, Aston Villa. And through it all, you know, I've, I've gone through hell and back with many things, successes and failures. But Villa has always been my constant. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, to, you know, we talk about football, how much we love it, but it's really more than just a sport. It's also a way how it, you can connect with it from a human perspective. And and that's Aston Villa to me. Yeah. And I, I mean, like I um, read your it's in it's in your pinned tweets isn't it and um you know your story about aston villa and your love for them and i just found like what you've said it's not just football it's not just sport that's how you met your best friend and you know and that's so much more you know so like football actually brings people together and i think a lot of the time we 
we don't you know narrate that enough almost so um absolutely no you're absolutely right i mean look at what happened uh, during the christian erickson tragedy right a horrific moment where everybody you know had their heart on their throat we don't know christian erickson personally we're not danish but we all connected in that moment and the stadium singing his name and the team collectively forming a ring around him and the medical staff being heroic it's just all of that put us all in one place just get better erickson and it's because the sport brought us together and and he fought back i mean obviously the most important thing is that he recuperated but it the sport is so united in many ways that we forget uh in, in many ways like you said it's more than the sport and and that's just another example and my story with villa is another one yeah it's, it's awesome it's a really good story so yeah people do go and check it out um speaking about aston villa they obviously gave us a, a good hiding in the league last year um after, <laughs> i wasn't uh, gonna bring it up richie uh, <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> oh. it's a recurring nightmare if i'm honest um but like to to, to slot seven past you know the defending we were, champions of the premier league at exactly that yeah, yeah yeah and and but to flip that as well like Aston Villa barely avoided relegation the year yeah. before that. And that, so, like, they've come on so well. I mean, obviously, you've mentioned Jack Grealish before and he's had a big, big part in it. But how do you find this? How th how far do you think that this Aston Villa team can go in the forthcoming season? Uh, it's a good question, Richard. Listen, like, uh, you know, uh, being a lifelong Villa fan, I can tell you the highs and the lows, right? Uh, and obviously, for many years, uh, three specifically, we were in the championship and you know, in the middle of it, I, I, we were really facing the very lows. There was a point where we were like not many points away from the relegation zone in the championship. So much in debt. We were relying so much on so many things to go our way. You know, we had Steve Bruce who, you know, bless him. He was trying to, he did get us to that final, but we lost to Fulham. And I just thought, my God, that's just the end. And then, you know, uh, we, we, we got some new owners who completely changed everything about us. And one of the main things was, of course, not just uh, helping us financially, but thinking completely different about the team and the club. And Dean Smith was that first piece. Uh, we talk about Marcelo Viesa. We talk about all these other managers that have done so well, and rightly so. But Dean Smith, and if you're English, I think you should celebrate somebody like Dean Smith. Like, you know, came from the lower ranks, a lifelong Villa fan. Obviously, he was managing Brentford before then. And in his first season, brought us back to the Premier League. As you mentioned, we struggled in the first one, but there's a vision. There's a philosophy. There's a culture that's being instilled and it's being supported. And I think that's a very important thing to remember. You know, since that's why at the very beginning of the last season, sort of the sort of August before last season started, I said, I don't know where we'll end up, but I can tell you one thing. You will see some amazing things from Aston Villa just because of the vision that we were instilling and the squad. Everybody is all in. So that win, that ridiculous win, that nightmare that you talk about when we, you know, uh, beat you guys uh, in that fashion. Honestly, it wasn't a fluke. It was, it was, it was, it was just. It was obviously timing, and and there were issues that came with your club. Obviously, you didn't play well, but it was a good example of where Villa is going. And look, we we didn't lose to uh, Arsenal. We beat them as well. Twice. I was at that game. I was at that game. The home game. There you go. There you go. Such a good performance. We Chelsea, we beat them in the, you know, we drew and beat Chelsea as well, you know, and there were a few issues uh, halfway through, obviously losing Jack Grealish in so many games didn't help, but it's not just about Jack Grealish. There's a real system here. I mean, you know, we have two players in the England squad. It really could have been three with Ollie Watkins. It could have been four. I think Ezri Konza really yeah. got totally overseen, but we have a serious vision. And Emiliano Wendia is another example of that. He saw that. So when people say, no, I can't believe he chose Villa over Arsenal, it's like, that if you really look at it, I can. Because one of them doesn't have a plan and is in debt. We are debt free. We have a plan, a good manager, and Emiliano Martinez. So, you know, those are things that just help. So to me, I'm very optimistic about the future. I think next season, depending on how the summer goes as well, in terms of another major transfer, I think Dean Smith wants to bring in one more key player. I'm hoping that that's enough for us to really get a European spot. That's how optimistic I am about it. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, I'm very happy. Villa fans are very optimistic. And, and listen, we've won the European Cup in 1982. We're not just like some small club. So, you know, uh, it, it was long overdue, but make no mistake about it. The club is going in the right direction and the manager, Dean Smith, is just uh, has been a savior. Personally. Yeah, 
Uh, just sorry, sorry, uh, Rich. Um, but, but just personally, I was going to say you, you mentioned those those signings. I just think that, as you said, there's just a clear philosophy there, and like the fact that you went out, you saw a player. It's a bit like Liverpool, actually. You went out, you saw a player, you won that player, you got that player. Like, didn't matter how much you needed to pay, you got him. Ollie Watkins, I think, it was absolutely inspired signing last season. Lots of people slated it for the for the price. But he's he's come good, and he will come good even more. I think he'll be an England international much more regularly soon. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's really really positive vibes for Aston Villa, and it's good to see them back because uh, there were it was it was the Premier League was missing them. I think, especially a stadium like stadium like Villa Park. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, Anfield is a special special stadium, and I think Villa Park uh, has offered a lot of historical moments as well. And and, and to your point about Ali Watkins, by the way, it's just a good example of like what we're doing when it comes to identifying talent. People really get lost in the whole, oh, is he worth this much or whatever. A, a player's worth is as important as the value that he brings in. And Ollie Watkins became our top goal scorer for, you know, I think ever in this point. More than the Gabby Abgonlehor ever did, I think. You know, I have to double check that. But he's that important. Ezri Konza also came from the championship. Matty Cash from Nottingham Forest. All these people are helping. So when it comes to identifying talent, I really, if I have like some kind of suggestion to you know, other clubs that are trying to be on the up. Don't completely disregard places like the championship, etc., because there's a lot of gems in there that, that are just waiting to be discovered. There's a gem in there at the moment, and he's uh, he came from my home club, Peterborough United, in uh, Ivan Tony. Oh, he's a, I want him so badly. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, I mean, it, it's one of those that had Brentford not have gone up he would have make, made that move to the Premier League. I don't know what, what he's going to do now, obviously, but there are there are absolutely gems in the championship. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. Um, what, and one's coming forget, back to Anfield just... as well, in Harvey Elliott. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, man. Um, another one from the, that actually played a lot in the championship and is uh, improving more in the Premier League, Jack Grealish, of course. Um, he's he's un unreal. One of my favourite footballers to watch in the world, I would say. Uh, but there is some rumours floating around, as there always is, uh, that Manchester City might be interested in him. Uh, what, what are your opinions on that? Well, the rumours are true. I think that, you know, Pep Guardiola has always been a fan. Uh, and, you know, it's it, it's not, you know, there's no, uh, there's no hidden, foggy kind of, uh, you know, messy reports here. You know, Man City would be the leader when it comes to being interested in Jack Grealish. Uh, but a few obstacles go in the way if you're a Man City fan, if you want Jack Grealish. First of all, uh, they're also interested in Harry Kane. And I think when Pep Guardiola looks at his squad, he needs to, if he wants Jack Grealish, he needs to really sell uh, a lot more players in order to, to make it happen because there's so many players in that position. Harry Kane is a major interest as well for City. Obviously, Sergio Aguero gone. They only have Gabriel Jesus at the moment. They need another number nine. But Jack Grealish is interested. Here's the thing, though. And this is what I said on Twitter. You know, I can't predict the future. I, I do know this, though. Villa is in no need. They don't, there's no desperation to sell. We're not in debt. So, you know, whatever price they want to put, it's going to happen. There's also conversations already reportedly being had between the club and Grealish and what they want to do. Emiliano Buendia came to support the Grealish, not to replace him. He wouldn't have come here if he was a replacement. He comes to support him. So that's another thing. And if you want Jack Grealish, you need to pay over a hundred million pounds. Like that's just what's going to happen. So can we do that with a, you know, if you're a Man City fan with a financial fair play, et cetera, and if you're trying to get Harry Kane, I don't know. I'm not, I'm speaking as a, you know, I'm trying to remove my Aston Villa bias for a second. I'm, you know, I wish As uh, Jack Grealish nothing but the best, but you know, if you want him, if any club wants him, they're going to have to really pay a lot. And uh, Villa is in no desperation to sell. It's it's not really like a, even like a Jaden Sancho Borussia Dortmund situation where they might see that money helpful. Villa is not they're in no desperation to sell. And Jack Grealish is so important to it. And the other part of it is like, you know, Grealish is kind of like like, uh, you know, like somebody, a reporter asked him the same thing, like Francesco Totti, a one man club. You know, he joined the club when he was six years old. Like he like he lives and breathes Aston Villa. So it's going to be a really big thing to try and sway him away. It, Man City, to me, would be the only one in the Premier League that would that would be able to do that. Anybody else, I think they have to financially worry about so many other things. And especially, like you've said, with, you know, with Manchester City, they need a striker more than they need a Jack Grealish. Yeah, and, absolutely. If it, yeah. and if you're Jack Grealish, you're certainly not forcing a move away from Aston Villa. Like you've said, he's an Aston Villa fan through and through. So I don't know. I think I think it's just that 
I don't, you know, it depends what you read into it. I personally think it's just a rumour that is out there. Maybe they've declared some interest and that's it. Because it's Jack Grealish, because it's a Euros, because let's face it, he's one of England's best players, although he didn't get into the starting lineup the other day. Yeah, don't even uh, get which, me going on that one, Mike. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which, is, which is bizarre. But anyway, that's by the by. So, um, mm-hmm. I can, yeah, I think a lot depends on Harry Kane. I think. This yeah, future. I think you said, Rich, I think you said it perfectly. There's interest, no doubt. It's like, you know, but we could have a, like a, a list of the, the, the length of, uh, of, of Anfield to say like how, how many people are interested, yeah. whether they make an official offer and whether that offer gets accepted. You know, that's another question. So obviously there's going to be interest. It's Jack Grealish, but can you realistically pay over a hundred million pounds? Because that's what's going to cost you over that much amount. It's not going to be anything less than that. So, and that's the willing that you have to pay. And then, and then Villa still has to accept it. And to your point, Grealish is very happy at Villa, you know, and, you know, his dreams have been, you know, being part of the England squad and then, you know, elevating himself with Aston Villa. So this next season is a big one because this is the one where we have to, okay, we're putting all this money in, bringing players like Emiliano Wendia, et cetera. Okay, now we need to show for it. Now we need to really you know, get a top six uh, at the very least to try and see that we're matching and justifying our objectives. Absolutely. If talking about transfers, then if you could choose one player to pick to transfer from Liverpool to your beloved Aston Villa, only one. Just one. Just one. (laughs) Who would it be and why? Come on, that's so obvious, isn't it? Mohamed Salah, I mean, he is just magical. His birthday today, I believe, as we speak, right? I can't remember. Mm, It is. Yeah, yeah. It was Listen, your birthday the other day as well, wasn't it? So happy birthday. It was. Yeah, my, yeah, thank you very much. See, yeah, 20, Gemini. 21st, 21st, was it? <laughs> yeah, I'm like two 20-year-olds, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, listen, there's so many talented players. But, you know, Mohamed Salah is one of them. Just do, He is just unbelievable. The fact that he would nearly got golden boot in the Premier League and he was out for so long, it just, it just speaks volumes on the kind of player that he is. I think he's a tremendous star. The Premier League, not just Liverpool, is so lucky to have him. And then another one I would say is uh, Jordan Henderson, to be honest with you. I, I've always wanted somebody in the middle. The problem with Villa is that in the midfield, we have a very hard working midfield. But we need just one more creator. John McGinn is not a move the chains kind of guy, right? Douglas Luiz is more of a protector. And then we have to fill in that role because Ross Barkley didn't work out. And then Morgan Sanson came in, whatever. Jordan Henderson would be so good. It's never going to happen. I'm just, you know, that's the kind of player that I would love. But my number one, Mohamed Salah. I mean, I've always been a fan. I mean, just such an amazing player. So he's just incredible. For I'm me, he's so underappreciated. I mean, didn't, didn't say Devo <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> who? Uh, who? <laughs> Devo Karigi. Oh, <laughs> maybe a league cup will put him in. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, he's a, he's a player. But you know, if you're asking me any player in Liverpool, it's gotta be Mohamed Salah. Yeah, yeah, he's. Um, I think Liverpool fans say it obviously more than anybody else, but he's so underappreciated in the Premier League for what he's done season after season. He's actually our only player who's actually managed to score more than twenty goals three times in a league season, which is phenomenal considering how many great strikers Liverpool have had throughout the years. Passing and it's him who's done it. And Robbie Fowler. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he is, he's again, like another genie. People won't realize until he's gone, how great he was. And I think that's and isn't it amazing, Rigi, that like, isn't it amazing that he was a Chelsea reject, then went to Roma, then it's just, <laughs> yeah. Chelsea do that a lot, don't they? Kevin De Bruyne, Romelu Lukaku, it's just funny. But Mohamed Salah is another good example, a tremendous player and a great human being outside of the pitch as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I could talk all day about Salah. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, he's a, he's a very special player, but like, like, a lot of footballers, a really special human being as well. And I think that obviously outweighs his, his footballing abilities. Absolutely. Yeah. Talking about uh, other human beings, of course. Uh, tell us about, talk to us about your relationship with Fabrizio Romano. Um, <laughs> he, seems, he seems to know absolutely everything about football, transfers, contracts. Um, tell me what it's like wor- working with him and, and, and talking to him on a regular basis. So Rito Romano is, uh, first of all, he is a human being regardless of uh, what others may think he's not a robot he's not an <laughs> he does sleep uh n- not often but he is one of the hardest working nicest uh team players just uh professionals i've ever encountered uh he's a friend obviously uh but he's just he's just an amazing person who gives his all and it doesn't matter whether it's 
you know, my podcast or we go on HQ, which is our, our CBS sports version of Sky Sports or an article. He just gives it his all. And he lives, like you said, he lives, breathes and consumes this sport. He knows everything. And also, you know, he he, he also respects, uh, you know, uh, the professional field and everybody else that's also part of it, right? David Ornstein, et cetera. So like, he's always so respect. He's just an amazing, I can't h- speak highly enough. And I'm, I'm honestly not just saying that because I want to say some nice things about Fab. He, he really is such a great person, a great human who, who's always up for, you know, if I, if I, you know, three in the morning, uh, on a Sunday, I'm like, Fab, uh, can I get you in an hour? If he's up and he can do it, he'll do it. And, and he's, he's just a great dude. He's uh he's certainly a notification turned on on the Twitter <laughs> yeah, as well. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And if it's anything apart from Liverpool, I'm like, oh damn, I'm just waiting, waiting for the news, especially in the transfer windows, you know. So yeah, he's he's a he, he just seems like a great guy. He never rises to so he gets so much bait, doesn't he? Like from the trolls on Twitter and never reacts to it. And that takes quite a strong character to do that as well absolutely because if it was me i would have gone all out but yeah he's absolutely yeah I, I totally agree he he handles it so well and you have to you know he has more than three million followers he has to be very careful about how he presents himself but he's just he's just a, a, a fantastic professional a great human good man with um with so many names linked you know with big moves the likes of sancho harlan varan mbappe Grealish. Uh, what do you think the story or transfer of the summer is shaping up to be? We all, it looks as though Sancho is is obviously Manchester United bound and that's been that way for about a year. I think they're still negotiating between 11 million. Um, so it looks like that one's going to happen. But I mean, I'm not personally convinced this this summer about Haaland uh, or Mbappe, if I'm honest. Varane looks like he might go, but like it just seems like it's going to be a big summer. And especially after last summer with COVID and the pandemic, I know that clubs don't have a lot of money to splash around, but it just feels like there's something that I'm just waiting for one domino to fall and the rest are just going to come tumbling down and there's going to be transfers galore. Yeah, Rich, I completely 100% agree with you, especially about Haaland and uh, Kylian Mbappé. We have to remember that Haaland, his situation actually becomes more interesting next summer because of the cost and everything. And also Borussia Dortmund now uh, confirming Champions League football, you know, it makes things a little bit easier as well. Uh, to your point, Jadon Sancho closing in on Manchester United. Obviously, they're trying to meet some way closest to 95 million. Let's see if that happens. I mean, how Manchester United can do that with all the money they have uh, <laughs> in debt. But, you know, it's, it's a major uh, acquisition. Uh, and I reiterate and echo what you said. It's all about a domino effect. And I think it begins with Lionel Messi. Lionel Messi... The moment, and I think it seems that he's going to stay at Barcelona, the moment he signs that contract and says, I'm staying, I think other clubs will be like, all right, who else can I get? So to me, I think, honestly, it's Kylian Mbappé because the more I read about his quotes on staying at PSG, seem more intriguing by the minute. I don't know if he'll stay. So that could be one. And the other one is Harry Kane, obviously. Uh, Paolo Fonseca obviously being... You know, the, the Tottenham manager, manager reported obviously closing in on that and we'll see how much he can lure and make sure that he stays. But Harry Kane wants Champions League. And, you know, they're, they're, I just don't think, I don't think that Fonseca will do enough to contain him. We'll see what happens. But to me, Lionel Messi predicts and determines everything. And then Kylian Mbappé, Harry Kane, and to your point about Varane, you know, I'm sure he'll move, you know, with Alaba going to Real Madrid as well would be the major things. But Haaland, I don't think so this summer. There'll be interest, but I think the fact that it becomes more interesting next year and the fact that uh, Borussia has Champions League, I think makes it easier for Borussia Dortmund to keep him. Especially if Sancho's looking set to leave as well. If they lost right. Sancho and Haaland in one window, I think that yeah, that would decimate them, you know. So, although saying that, you know, I think his release clause next season is um, is it's around about 75 million, but Chelsea are willing to pay over 100 this, I mean, if obviously, if you r- believe the reports. For Dortmund, that must be quite still, knowing that you are going to lose Haaland for 75, do they keep him for another season? Or they might just use his Sancho money to... Uh, to rebuild and have a replacement for Haaland straight away for when when he goes. Yeah, they're in, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, Borussia mm. Dortmund, because they have to figure out what what to do, and they have to they they have to. The problem with Borussia Dortmund is like every problem with any Bundesliga team that's not called Bayern Munich. It's like you you just you're competing for second in Champions League, and 
Does Haaland want that? Does he want bigger? I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that he's going to leave Borussia Dortmund. The question is, like you said, if Chelsea or somebody come in with a higher bid than 75 million, do they go now? Do they say, look, we'll take that money and then maybe invest in two other players? Or do they say, no, we're going to try and rebuild once again? Because obviously the marketing uh, magnetism that Haaland brings to the club as well can't be taken for granted. But it's going to be a very interesting, you know, 14 months for Arlen Haaland for sure. I, th I think you mentioned Chelsea. Obviously, Thomas Ducal's done a brilliant job, won the Champions League already, but there's no way, shape or form, that they're guaranteed to get Champions League next season. I don't think, yeah. I, th I think there's only pretty much Manchester City that are guaranteed it. I mean, uh, and, and then the rest of the Premier League are catching up. Obviously, it's likely the way that they're going, the trajectory. But um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be so interesting with Erling Haaland. I, I, I love the player and I'd love to see him in the Premier League, even if it is at Man City and it's all breaking all the cheat codes and everything. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. He's incredible. I mean, he's just, he's a once in a lifetime type of talent. He's just amazing. I love everything about him. And I agree with you. I would love to see him in the Premier League, even if it is with Man City. And listen, mm. like the race for the Premier League next year is going to be really intriguing because obviously City, yourself, your boys, Liverpool and Chelsea, what Thomas Tuchel has done in that short span can only predict the fact that next season they're going to be even more, uh, you know, uh, demanding and commanding of, of the table and they're not just going to be satisfied with just a Champions League spot they're going to want much more and Erling Haaland to your point Rich if they make a, in a, a you know a bid then that's really saying all right we're here to win this whole thing you know yeah absolutely same as Man City with Kane that's right. you know it's it, he's going to get 40 goal contributions for Manchester City next season same as Haaland would for Chelsea so I think if, uh, yeah, from a Liverpool's point of view, we actually don't want those transfers at all because it will blow us out of the water, I, I fear. Um, but I think Liverpool are in, you know, I think we're in very good stead. Um, we've obviously already signed Ibrahima Konate, which was a huge signing for us because very that's good. really who we wanted in January. Let, let's be honest, you know, we could have finished the season a bit more comfortably rather than waiting on the final day if we had someone like Konate at the back after Van Dijk, Gomez, Matip. Um but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what Liverpool do because Liverpool don't seem to sign the megastars of Sancho, Haaland, and Bappe's uh, Harry Kane's. We seem to we seem to sign a Sadio Mane, and people give him loads of stick on the socials, and then he becomes a superstar. So it'll be interesting to see who's next for Jurgen Klopp and that what that conveyor belt will almost look like to who he transforms into the next Mane, Salah, Van Dijk. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, like, the one thing that I just want to say very quickly is that like, I think Liverpool, I, I'm sure I'm sure Liverpool fans know this, but I think everybody needs to know like what, what what Liverpool did to get Champions League football by the end of the season. Taking in mind all the injuries that happened is to me, honestly, I'm not I'm not even joking. To me, it's more impressive than winning the Premier League. Honestly, the fact that you know Virgil van Dijk, Dyke, no Gomez. Jordan Henderson was that. Salah was that for a while as well. And then the tragedies of, you know, Alisson losing his father, Jurgen Klopp as well, just everything that happened. The fact that by the end of that season, you managed to get Champions League, it's absolutely incredible. It's commendable, really. And I, I don't think it matters if you don't get a Haaland or whatever, but you do need somebody that really fits your system. And it can happen. And you can do it. You know, Pat Sandaka, you know, he's a tremendous asset. Right. But like if you can just strengthen your squad with some good talent, I think I, I think, you know, you'd be in you'd be in a good spot. It's it, because honestly, Jurgen Klopp will use everything that narrative from how you managed to get Champions League at the end of the season and put it into this new one and really go all out. Because I'm telling you, it was absolutely commendable uh, for what Liverpool did. Really tremendous stuff. It's uh, the mind still boggles. We actually finished third, so we did, we didn't even like we didn't even just scrape in. Yeah. We actually got quite comfortable in the end, finishing yeah, third. Which, amazing. Yeah. Tell you what, we've had uh, we've had a lot a lot worse teams uh, and a lot and a lot worse teams finish outside the top four. And we've we literally had Nathaniel Phillips and Reese Williams at centre back, two players who were playing in the Bundesliga two and the National League last year. It, <laughs> it's it's unbelievable. It seriously is, and like, everyone was so down and out. And the way that we came back at the end, and you know, took took advantage of teams slipping up because teams did slip up. They had to because we were that we were ninth at one point. Um, yeah. So so like they had to slip up. Obviously, I think I, we, I made a video about 
two or three months ago about Liverpool maybe signing Jack Grealish potentially and saying that Aston Villa might finish above Liverpool this season so he wouldn't want to come anyway <laughs> but, then, but then obviously it all played out it's just honestly a tremendous season and Jurgen Klopp you, know, you have one of the best managers in the world so you know it's it's you know, the unity among that, that squad is, is commendable Absolutely. I think uh, while we wind down here, then uh, we are obviously LFC transfer room and uh, transfers is our business. So one for you both, really. Uh, I think my my pick is quite obvious um, in Pats and Dakar. I think he's a hybrid that Liverpool need or somebody like a Dakar uh, is somebody at the moment that Liverpool need to really press for Mino. I think Taki Minamino was supposed to be that player, but obviously things haven't worked out so far. So I think someone does need to press Firmino and, you know, try to get the best out of him, but also be the next star in line. Firmino is not going to be around forever. Neither is Mane and neither is Salah. I think we've got Jota in, who is a phenomenal player. He's young. It's almost like, to me, Klopp is trying to build the Jurgen Klopp Liverpool version two now. And I think a Dakar mm-hmm. would come in and eventually, you know, after six months be embedded, hit the ground running, I say after six months. But we can do that. We can afford to do that. We don't necessarily need someone to come in straight away. So if you were to pick anybody in the current window that's a realistic target, so we can't say Jack Grealish, I'm afraid, Chris, because that's not <laughs> a realistic target. Um, I don't think anyway. Um, I would go, obviously, for Pats and Dakar uh, or a player very much like him. Um, you know, what What sort of player do you think we need? Or is, or is there a player that you think actually Liverpool just need that one player? Uh, Lewis, you're the guest today, so I'll, I'll go with you first. You can have first pick. Oh, you'll go with me first. Well, obviously, you're <laughs> thinking uh, an attacking-minded player, right? So, you know, somebody... Or anybody, that... anybody who you think is fit for Liverpool who would well, come I, in and... I'm... I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch you two people, okay? Um, and and maybe if you need that midfield strength or whatever, but you know the future captain of Peru is a, is a guy called Renato Tapia. He plays for Celta Vigo. He is a force, and he's gonna be obviously he's in Copa America. He's a future captain of Peru, but he's somebody that doesn't just move the chains, but he holds the midfield really well. I think we saw what happens when John and Harrison can get injured, and and Fabinho has to step in or whatever. I think you need like an in and out somebody that's just gonna hold that fort. Um, the same way sort of that, you know, uh, Rodri would do for Man City, even though they didn't do it in the Champions League final. But Guardiola, what were you uh, thinking? Sorry, so no, Renato, uh, Renato Tapia would be would be one of them. And uh, the other one to me is, I don't know if it, it's not really realistic, but you never know. I mean, Inter Milan are going through issues financially, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to say Romelu Lukaku. I'm actually going to say Lautaro Martinez. I think that he's somebody that that maybe can give you that, Almost uh, what Robbie Fowler would give you, which is, you know, move everywhere around the box. He's also a poacher. He can help bring people in. He actually holds the ball pretty well for somebody not that big. I I don't see it as realistic, but given Inter Milan's sort of lack of uh, vision, according to Antonio Conte, you never know. You you, you know, and and Zaghi maybe is not enough to persuade somebody to Lautaro. I just think you need somebody that gives you a little bit of a more mobile force as a number nine role. And I think somebody like that, I mean, Dak is a perfect uh, example, but I think somebody like Taro Martinez who like can really go anywhere across that trio and also be a number nine would be really helpful. Yeah. If Luis gets two, then I get two as well, right, Rich? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that's fine then. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Obviously you can't pick the same one though. No, no, it's fine. My my realistic one, really realistic one is Neuhaus. I think he would be, the perfect one album replacement. Obviously, I've only seen YouTube clips. I can't claim to watch every single Borussia Mönchengladbach game ever. You know, some people have got. Like, I need. I have to. I do things. You know, but I, I'd, lo- I'd love. Uh, I'd love to have him. He's he's been uh, a force for them in the last couple of seasons, and I just think he provides everything that Wijnaldum provided. But he's younger, and I think he can improve to be better than Wijnaldum. I don't think he is at the moment, but I think he can get above that level. Um, but my non-realistic one is Ollie Watkins. <laughs> um, I, I, I would absolutely. I, I clamoured it for it last summer, um, and you know, people were like, "Oh, he's in the championship. What are you on about?" I think he's Firmino and more, uh, and he can be. Uh, I think he provides the movement. I think he provides, you know, the goal scoring ability. Yes, he misses chances, which Firmino does, but I think he'd be the ideal uh, replacement. But that is probably going to cost us like seventy, eighty million. So uh, I, I'm, I'm good. Uh, I think uh, I'd stick with Dakar. <laughs> You, I, I'm sure. I, I'm glad. Operative word: unrealistic target. Chris, no way. Get away from Molly Watkins. <laughs> and I agree with you. He's to me, he's the best pressing striker in the Premier League. Um, and uh, you know, the fact that it was his first season, 
just unbelievable. Unbelievable. 14 goals, incredible. Imagine what he could do, you know, with Salah on one side and Mane on the other one. I'm, it's not going to happen, though. Oli Watkins. <laughs> Wendy on one side, Jack Grealish on the other one. Oli Watkins, thank you very much. And Bern, Bertan Traore as well. What a renaissance with him, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, you can expect good things from from Aston Villa. They seem to be, like you said, have a direction. And the fact that, I mean, you alluded to it earlier with Wendia not going to Arsenal, that didn't happen, you know, five years ago, let's say. And yeah, and it does show both clubs in, in the exact light that they should right now be portrayed in, you know, that this... that. This top four now is a myth of the, or the top six. This is a myth now that's that has been broken. We've seen it with Leicester again, unfortunately, not to get Champions League football this year. We've seen it even, you know, Aston Villa were flying high. We've seen Everton trying to breach into there. Leeds, yeah, Leeds United, United, by the way, this, yeah. Yeah. Leeds United this year. What you were saying earlier about a Premier League club, they belong in the Premier League. Aston Villa belong. Leeds United are a Premier League club through and through as well. And yeah. Marcelo Bielsa has done a phenomenal job there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that I think this top six has, has been broken now, and I think when Brand Deal deal was just just sealed that. Yeah, next season is going to be very exciting indeed. I think for everybody involved, even the, the teams that came up as well. I, I want to hot take something just quickly. Uh, Brighton will finish in the top half next season. So. Yeah, Graham Potter is a very good manager. Yes. And all he needs is a little bit more support. I agree. Brighton, yes. is a, he's a very good manager, Graham Potter. I, I want yeah. that to be clipped and I want to be roasted if I'm wrong. <laughs> I'll make sure that, yeah, I'll make sure that I'll bring it up. Even if, even if we forget, I'll make sure we bring it up. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say really like, thank you so much for having, uh, for us, you know, having you on and like, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Cause like your insight about football is, you know, is phenomenal. So um, yeah, thank you very much for that. And it's just nice to talk. You know, to other fans apart from uh, Liverpool fans and apart from the, the the abuse that we get on Twitter from every other fan. So, yeah, we just uh, we're, 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 you know, we're in this industry. We just have to take it on the nose. Right. Right, Richie. Yeah. But no, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I think you guys do a great job. Keep up the good work. And honestly, the best of luck to Liverpool. I've always uh, been a fan of your fans and, of course, your manager and your squad. So uh, but thank you so much for having me. No, that's fine. And hopefully uh, we'll all get to a game uh, together. As long as it's not seven two, it's fine, right? <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah. Hopefully for us, yeah, that would be the other way around, right? The other way. I can't, I can't see. Let's it. call it a draw, two zero, and we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> ah man, well that's uh, unfortunately all we have time for for this week's ed edition of the room, brought to you by LFC Transfer Room. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you will have a great European Championship. Until then, stay safe, take care, and from everyone here at the room, up the Reds.